Alright guys, finally got it. Part 7. Isla, the big hitter. Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, it's a strong word to use hate, but it is such an intense flavour, I can understand why people don't like it. Um, before we go any further, I do realise that I'm dressed like a James Bond villain. Uh, just something new I bought, I didn't realise how much it would make me look like I belong in Spectre. Anyway, enough past that. Um, Isla. Wonderful little island on the west coast. Well, wonderful to some, not so much to others. Home to eight distilleries, soon to be ten in the next couple of years. Can I do this alphabetically in order? We have Ardbeg, Beaumont, Bonnerhaven, Kalila, Lefroig, Kilhoman, Lefroig, uh, Lagavulin, and... Brooklatic. Okay, that was terrible. Anyway, there's eight altogether currently producing, uh, and the other two distilleries to be open in the next couple of years. One is called Gartbreck, which is not too far from Port Ellen, and the other one is called. begins with an A, and it's going to be opened by the guys who own Hunter Lang. Um, Ardnamore, I think. I think that's what it's called. Um, but anyway, to give you a brief story about what peat is, uh, unfortunately I don't have like a demonstration block. Um, it's a familiar thing to this island, and most of the west coast as a whole. So, if you think back to when whiskey production was in its mainstay, sort of like 1820s onwards, when a lot of things were becoming legal and more distilleries were popping up here, there and everywhere. Um, on the east side of Scotland, and throughout the central part of Scotland, uh, most of the mainland, uh, trains had access to charcoal. So they could transfer charcoal all the way along to distilleries, and if you've ever been to any distilleries, certainly in the east side of Scotland, up at Aberdeenshire in that way, there's, tra uh, there's old railway lines everywhere, especially running through Speyside. So charcoal was used to help malt the barley. Uh, on the west coast, sadly, you can't get a train over the water, and it's far too expensive to use a boat to ship peat, uh, to ship coal rather, or charcoal. So they were using peat to help malt their barley. And like most things in the spirits world, it's just a happy coincidence to be honest with you. Uh, residents of these islands all along the west coast of Scotland were using peat to build fires with, to cook food with, to build their houses out of. And it kind of made sense that at the point where your barley has, has germinated and has produced some soluble sugars, you need to kill that growth off. So, you know, if you put it in a kiln, you light a fire, a lot of modern distilleries use uh, charcoal, uh, use gas fire, and they tend to put maybe like a block of peat on, a small block. Every distillery in Scotland will peat to some degree. Um, I think that's a very important thing. But on the West Coast, they do it a lot. So they'll use still old school fires and they'll just throw a couple of chunks of peat onto it. The stuff smokes for days and it will infuse into the barley as it's killing off the germination. You then ferment it, you then distill it, you get a spirit, it smells a little bit smoky. Um, that is uh, making whiskey in a very, very short uh, story. And here we look at two very different distilleries from the island. So even though most whiskey in Ireland is heavily peated, there are a few exceptions. And the first one is Bonnerhaven. Now, Bonnerhaven is one of the most beautiful distilleries in the world. I've still never visited it, but I've had loads of people sing its praises to me. I've had really good friends visit there, and every single whiskey I've tried from them has been so good. Like, so, so good. And here, we have the basic 12-year-old. Now, they have released heavily peated bottles in the past, um, but this is widely available throughout most whiskey retailers or specialist whiskey retailers and as you'll notice from the colour it is quite a dark whiskey. So this is fully matured in X sherry casks. Uh, 12 years old as a minimum, 46.3% natural colour and no filtration. Owned by the same company who own Tobermory Distillery, so the Lechick we reviewed in the previous video, Burn Stewart, wonderful distillery, Billy Walker who's the master distiller at Ben React used to work for them, um, they sell whiskey internationally and domestically. They're, they're just a fantastic little company. Very under the radar company, which is fantastic. Uh, distillery was established in 1881, so it's a relatively new distillery in the grand scheme of things. And I believe that this is actually an unpeated spirit. Um, to, the mo to the best of my knowledge, I believe it is an unpeated spirit. Like I said, they do do heavily peated stuff, but I think this is no peatier than you know, like an, an old Pulteney or a Klein Leash or something on the east coast of the high northeast coast of Scotland. So you take a little look at that colour and already you're kind of imagining a lot of the flavours that you get from this. 
So let's dig right in and have a little smell. Mm. It's very, very hoodied. Um, if I had to take a guess at the, the sherry cassie, it smells a lot like Pedro Jimenez. It's quite a sweet, opulent sherry style. It's not as dry as the Oloroso stuff. You kind of get that wonderful hit of um, kind of minted dark chocolate. There's a little bit of kind of um, a petrol station note with it. Um, that's a smell I quite enjoy anyway. I know you shouldn't, but I do quite enjoy that smell of petrol and diesel. Kind of tar and oil. It smells very dense, it smells very heavy. And then, of course, using sherry casks, you're going to get that classic Christmas cake note style. Um, I am recording this in sort of early-ish November, so it fits very well with the timing and the atmosphere right now. So yeah, rich, heavy, very honeyed, just very thick textures altogether. Honey and oil and tar and all that kind of stuff. Let's have a go. So yeah, there's, there's not a lot of smoke at all in any way. There's not a lot of smoke on the nose. There's not a lot of smoke on the palate. There's the tiniest bit towards the finish, but it's more of a... Um, I don't know if it's a smoke. I don't know if it's just a connotation of peated whiskey because it's a bit salty. Yeah, kind of... When you put a little bit too much salt on, a, on like a, a piece of fish or some chips or something, it's got a kind of slightly... Really, really savoury saltiness going on with it, just towards the end though, and it's a tiny amount. But beyond that, oh, it's sweet. Um, it hits your tongue, and initially you get this little wave of honey. Like it's really honey orientated. It's probably more honey orientated than Balvenie or Aberfeldy, and that's saying something. Washes across your palate. Just delivers this kind of abundance of raisins and sultanas and wonderful, you know, wintry style marinated fruits. Again, Christmas cake. The minty thing's gone. There's not a lot of mint anymore. And then, after all this sweetness has kind of had its time and done its work, you get this awesome wave of spice. It's not overbearing. It's just enough to counterbalance that really rich sherry sweetness. And after the spice, comes that wonderful saltiness towards the end. That, in my eyes, is like a, a genuine session product. I know a couple of people who aren't a fan of that, but like the 18 and the 25, those are the other two regular bottles they do. Um, I could quite happily sit down with a big group of friends at a table and get through that bottle quite easily. Um, a lot of people are put off by how dark the bottle is, but I quite like that. I think it harks back to the whole kind of smuggler's nature of Isla and all the illegal stuff they used to do on the island. Hmm. So, not very Isla-like at all. It's really rich, it's quite easy drinking, there's a good amount of honeyed sweetness to it, and there's just a slightly salty finish. So it's not very typical Isla, but it is made on Isla. So the purpose of this review is to kind of show you that there is a contrast. It's not all about big, you know, TCP medicinal dentist-like smells and flavours. It can be as rich as a lot of products, and I actually think, going out of limit, that's actually a better heavily sherried whiskey than a lot of the big heavily sherried whiskey brands produce. Um, not going to mention any names, but that is, if you want something that's quite organic and is high ABV, is sub £45, pounds, £45 pounds or below, and uses great quality, and it's heavily sherried. Look at Isla. Who does think it? Wonderful little product. 
Now, going against the trend, I've forgot water and I don't want to run off camera, so we'll just kind of we'll dive straight into the Port Charlotte. So a lot of people who are familiar with Isla know about Brook Laddick, or Brook Laddick, Brook Laddick, uh, their resurgence over the past couple of years. So a few years back they got bought out by Remy Quantro, uh, and the range got shrunk. Now I think one year before they were bought, they released something silly like 36 brand new expressions, which is a lot. And fans of the distillery, um, it was kind of like quite difficult to keep up with what was being released, what was consistent, what wasn't. Um, so Remy came in and he took it over and they just kind of went, slow down a little bit, let's condense everything, let's have a standard range. You can still do all the weird fun stuff, but let's have a standard range so people know what to look for. So they do two unpeated bottlings. One is called the Classic Laddie and it comes in a wonderful blue bottle. And the other one is called the Isla Barley and that tends to be six years old, not peated, uh, fully matured, I believe, in ex-Buffalo Trace barrels, which are heavily charred. Um, I think that was the 2009 one anyway. I remember doing some staff training on that. Um, then they have the Port Charlotte series, of which this is one of them. They do a Scottish barley and an Isla barley. So home source barley and outsourced barley, essentially. Here I have the Scottish barley, so all the pot barleys peated on the mainland. And then they also do the Octomore series, which is the heavily peated whiskey the world's ever seen. Um, I won't go into that because when I review one, I'll talk about it. But yeah, they do the Octomore, which is just an insane line of products. Um, Port Charlotte itself, which is what this whiskey is named after, doesn't actually say Brook Claddock on it anywhere. It has the little stamp in the bottom corner, but it doesn't physically say Brook Claddock anywhere on the front, which is why I think a few people get confused. Um, Port Charlotte used to be a distillery, and it's a couple of miles south of Brook Claddock on Isla. Um, I remember doing a kind of video tweet tasting session with Adam Hannett for the MP1 or the MP2 series and one of my colleagues asked him what's going on with Port Charlotte and they own the trademark to the distillery name um, that distillery now doesn't produce they have no plans to reproduce it at that distillery as far as I'm aware um, but they own the trademark to that name so this is just kind of like an ode to that distillery uh, this is peated to around the same level as your Lefroigs and your Ardbecs so you should be expecting quite a lot 50% alcohol, non-chill filtered, natural colour. Uh, and again, just quite different to the Bonner Harvin straight away, a very usual colour. It's kind of a wonderful bourbon cask gold colour. Let's smell it. Already it's, it's entirely different. So now we have that coastal, earthy, burnt, uh, barbecue style going on. I purposely didn't review Lefroig and Ardbeg or like a villain because they're quite widely available in like most bars, so you can kind of go in and like buy a shot for a couple of quid, you know, or dollars or again, or whatever. Um, this is a little bit more unusual for the Isla style because it's not, it's typical in its smells and what you expect from it, but then it does a few other interesting things too. Harking back to that lechic I was reviewing in the previous video, it has a very barbecue style approach. Lefroy is so medicinal, it reminds me of sitting in a dentist's chair and they've got the gloves on and they're putting things in your mouth and all that kind of thing. It's that for me, that's what Lefroy is. Lagavulin, classically with a 16 year old, is just, it's like standing next to a bonfire with some sort of, you know, sweet mulled wine or something. It's got a lot going on inside, it's a very complex whiskey. Ardbeg is like, standing next to a smoker. Now they're all heavily peated but they all have their own different inclinations of what peter is and there are various different styles of peat as well. Um, that's something I won't go into a lot of detail with because there are so many articles online about the different styles of peat and different locations of peat. Now because this has been peated on the mainland it will use mainland peat. A lot of people say why don't you use an Isla peated whiskey? Well because I want to do things a bit differently. So this will use mainland peat which is like what Anok use, which is like what Ben Riak use. So you're going to get a slightly different style and it is more barbecue than it is medicinal and you certainly get it from it. It's a little bit mineralic as well, it reminds me of kind of limestone and chalk. Mm. 
Now that has something that one of my friends calls laddie funk. Brooke Laddie does have this really unique style to their spirit. And this starts off much like the Bonner Harvin, it starts off quite sweet. Combination of bourbon barrels, the more floral notes from that Highland style peat. And then out of nowhere, you just get this attack of chili spice. It's like chewing on a jalapeno. Like at the start, it's fine, and then like five seconds in, you just kind of like, that's a lot to deal with, depending on your tolerance of spicy food. Um, but yeah, that comes out of nowhere with a lot of spice. And again, you kind of get that slightly chalky acetone note with it, which I actually quite enjoy in the Port Charlotte style. It's very distinctive of that style. Towards the finish. Spice still remains. You can still taste it. You still get, it's not the dominant flavor, but it's being split a little bit by fresh citrus. And I always get it from whether it's Highland Pete or whether it's Isle of Pete or Isle of Sky style whiskies. There's always a very clean, either lemon or lime style with it. Uh, like Young Lagavulin, like the eights and the twelves, it's all about really fresh lemon. With Ardbeg, it's a bit limey. It's a bit more, it's a bit kind of sweet sour rather than just all out sour. This reminds me of kind of like lemon, lemon sherbet drops, those kind of candied sweets with the um, sherbet on the inside of them. And it just cleanses your palate towards the back. It's an extremely intense product with a lot of variation. It's complex intensity, which is probably the best way to describe Brook Laddick as a whole. Um, they're a little bit punk rock. Um, they do a lot without doing a lot at the same time. Um, it's a really slow distillation rate of Brook Laddick too, so every drop takes a long time to mature and actually come out of the stills. So you're going to get a much thicker, richer, heavier spirit as a result of that. And again, sweet, kind of bourbon top, kind of slightly vinegary barbecue notes. Into spice, which is so warming and just kind of makes your eyes tingle. It's like, whoa, whoa, look on. Like, it really makes you aware of what you're drinking. And then towards the end, like clean citrus, those kind of dry vermouth Manhattan cocktail styles. Wow. Certainly a product. Um, that, pri that price range for that is so anywhere between about 50 to 55, I believe, for the Port Charlotte, um, in terms of scoring. They're both different but equal, which is a phrase I've not used for a while. This is, it looks particularly unassuming, but delivers so much sweetness and so much richness that you would mistake it for a space side. And a really, really, really good space side at the same time. This is just giving you every flavour on the face of the planet in steps and stages. You start off in step one, it's sweet, step two becomes spicy, step three becomes salty, and then step four becomes clean and refreshing. They're both going to get 8 out of 10. Because they're not very typical Islas, and I know this video says Isla review on it, but they are very unique to Isla. And this guy's based in the very north, this guy's based in kind of like the southwest part of the island. And given that they're on the same island and they're only a couple, you know, a couple of tens of miles apart, well, maybe a few hundred miles, um, they're so extremely different. And you would not think they were from the exact same place. Um, whereas your big hitters like Lafroy Garbeg, like a in, less so Bowmore, that's more of a soft approach to things, but certainly Kalila and uh, Kilhoman too. And those guys hit big and they, they do it in intensity. These two are a little bit different. So there you go. That is it. That is the end of the seven week tour.